So let's get started with tonight's uh, presentation. We're going to be looking at uh, what is called catastrophic plate tectonics, and uh, we're going to be looking at this through the eyes of the Grand Canyon. But the goal tonight is to examine uh, in some brief way some of the models that creationists, uh, creation geologists, and geophysicists over the years have offered to explain what we see in the real world, geologically speaking. And um, we're going to be focusing on uh, just one topic. So we'll look at uh, some uh, large-scale flood models, as I'd mentioned. Then we'll focus in on catastrophic plate tectonics. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about where we need to go uh, as far as our geologic research uh, is concerned. Geology is one of those areas where creationists have a lot of horsepower, and um, uh, so that's uh, kind of a nice thing. It's uh, somewhat different than the astrophysics area that we saw last time. So let's take a look at some of the uh, large-scale geologic models that have been offered over time. We'll just briefly mention them. I won't even discuss many of the details. Uh, over the years, of course, many people have felt that uh, <clears throat> the flood was entirely miraculous, every little bit of it, and uh, that has been uh, often argued. But that doesn't really help us generate empirical models. It's not much, there's not much you can test if everything's a miracle. There's not much you can test scientifically uh, and mathematically. So this particular idea of... Uh, uh, for establishing a, an empirical model. It just doesn't really work all that well. Uh, then we have what's called vertical tectonic model. This is being currently offered by Michael Lord and uh, very much published through the Creation Research Society quarterly. And um, uh, so you may want to uh, look at that periodical to get uh, a lot of information on this particular model. Then there's the hydroplate model by Walter Brown. Uh, Walt Brown has come up with a model where the plates, um, where the crust of the earth is essentially or was essentially floating on a water layer and uh, due to a instability, uh, the, uh, the, um, the waters exploded essentially creating our current geologic column and that's one particular model. Then we have the expanding earth model by Glenn Morton. Uh, we brought him up way back when, in the early 90s, and he gave us a nice presentation. We uh, provided him with some helpful suggestions on his model. Uh, where that has gone, I, I don't know. Uh, then we have the vapor canopy model, which is not strictly a geological model, but it does impact the uh, geologic model. Uh, the vapor canopy has come under some um, uh, sad news, in the sense, because of the heat required uh, or generated by a water canopy. As you know, if you remember your basic chemistry, wa water can hold a lot of heat. And uh, uh, just a little bit of water in the atmosphere uh, can do us some decent damage here in terms of uh, making an environment that's a little bit too hot for us to, to handle. So the vapor canopy has uh, kind of come under a little bit of um, uh, dislike over the last decade or so, I would say. And, um, but there's still a lot of good things uh, that I think need to be looked at. There are other types of canopy models that, uh, as we had mentioned earlier in this series. Then, of course, there are astronomical models where the geologic column that we see today was caused by some kind of astronomical uh, catastrophe, whether it be meteorites or uh, uh, things like that crashing into the Earth's surface. And um, uh, so a lot of models like this have been offered. And such as uh, ice chunk collisions also. Uh, Melvin Cook in 1986 uh, maintained that uh, the, uh, the flood came about by a major impact around the area of Iceland. Because if it's what's it, what is interesting about this model is if you look and we'll see the uh, Mid Atlantic Ridge. There's a big glob right in the middle of that ridge in the North Atlantic, and it happens to be Iceland. <clears throat> and then, of course, we have what we're going to focus in on a little bit tonight, catastrophic plate tectonics. Uh, this was formulated uh, by John Baumgartner in 1986 at the International Conference on Creationism right here in Pittsburgh. 
And it was further developed in 1994 by what uh, we affectionately call the Gang of Six, Steve Austin, John Baumgartner, Russ Humphreys, Andrew Snelling, Larry Vardaman, and Kurt Wise. This was also published in the ICC Journal in 1994. Now the reason why I have chosen to focus a little bit on to the catastrophic plate tectonic model is because this model, more than any other model that we've mentioned here today, has been submitted to peer review. More than that, it has gone through some significant computer modeling and mathematical modeling. So when you look at all these particular models that have been offered, in terms of the research and review that has gone into these models, catastrophic plate tectonics as it currently sits, is probably sitting at the top of the review pile, if you will, pyramid. Uh, then probably next would be the vertical tectonical model of uh, tectonic model of Michael Lord through the um, Creation Research Society quarterly. So <clears throat> let's take a look at what we are talking about when we're talking about catastrophic plate tectonics. So what we're saying today is we're going to be looking in a little bit of a a little bit more detail into the catastrophic plate tectonic model which has been offered by John Baumgartner and others as, a, as an empirical model to explain the flood. Okay? This particular idea began way back in 1859. You might remember what was so significant about that year. That also happened to be the year that uh, Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. And Antonio Snyder also published a book, and in there he opted for a uh, movement of the plates that we see here in this particular uh, photograph, that the uh, pre-flood continental glob, if you will, on the earth was a single land mass and was split apart at Noah's flood in the configuration that we essentially see today. The interesting thing is this was 1859. And uh, so it's been around for a long time, and um, uh, John Baumgartner happened to resurrect this reference. All right, so as we had mentioned before, uh, the, the, this particular model was first introduced at the ICC in 96. It was further uh, researched and built uh, in 1994, and since then um, there have been a plethora of articles uh, published uh, in various uh, uh, research uh, uh, articles and uh, research uh, magazines. Um, so, let's take a look at what we have then. Here we have basically the internal structure of the Earth. Uh, in, the, in the center we have the inner core. That's basically a very hot, somewhat of a solid core. Then around the solid core we have this fluid outer core. That's also very hot. And then we have the mantle. And then finally we have the crust. Now the crust of the earth, of course, is where you and I live and breathe. And so this crust is sitting on essentially the mantle. And um, so what we have here in this particular slide is how the uh, ocean and continental crusts are related to each other. Now, according to the model, the continental crust, the density is less than the uh, density of the ocean crust. What that means then is it's lighter, so it floats, it tends to float. So the continental uh, shelf then is floating on top of the mantle, and it, it would be therefore higher than the, um, the ocean crust. Then, just before the flood, uh, the text tells us that the fountains of the great deep were all broken up. But we see that the mantle density and the continental crust were less than the ocean crust. Okay, so we still have this floating idea, and uh, things are getting ready to um, provide a problem. The, at the initiation of the flood, the biblical text explicitly states that the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And so there's several things that we can capture from this. 
Um, first of all, it says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up in a single day, okay? And that the windows of he heaven were also opened on that particular day. So when the flood started, the entire event began to happen, okay? So there are two essentially causes, if you will, of the flood, this, these fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven, okay? So the, switch, the situation just prior to the flood, we have the mantle, and on top of that we have this cold, dense oceanic crust, and then finally we have the, the, uh, the ocean on top of that. Okay, so it's important to recognize that this density of material, um, the more dense it is, the heavier it is. So if you are uh, on a lighter material, or a, a less dense material, you would tend to float on top of this, of the mantle structure. Well, <clears throat> when the fountains of the deep broke up, what happened was then this molten material from the mantle below the crust uh, came shooting up, if you will, and, of course, what would happen? It would change the temperature of this material and therefore change the density. Okay? So what is going on at the time of the flood, the ocean basins then are starting to rise. Okay? Because the, they're getting hotter and hotter. And so during the flood, the, the ocean would have been uh, displaced from the ocean, the then ocean basin, being cast onto the continental shelf because now they're changing positions, if you will. And what's causing, what's happening then is the continental geology is being dredged by this mass of water coming in from the ocean basins. So you, with this shifting of height in the continents and ocean basin, you have water literally dredging out the antediluvian column of the continental shelf, all due to this change in uh, density and temperature of, these, of this material. So um, as the flood is progressing then, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, sorry, <laughs> we're getting ahead of ourselves, um, the fountains of the Great Deep are breaking up, and you can see this spreading in what's called subduction in this particular slide. So as the um, fountains of the Great Deep are breaking up in the center of this slide, that is forcing the plates, the continental plates, to move outward. And <clears throat> at the other end then, they perform what's called subduction. They go into the mantle core un underneath uh, the adjacent plates that they might be uh, adjacent to and that causes a lot of geologic activity, creates a lot of heat, okay? So these fundamental, three fundamental forces are very important in the catastrophic plate model. The spreading of the continental shelf, or the continental plates, uh, the subduction, and of course this mantle-wide flow that you see, this convection in the mantle. So here we see the idea of subduction. This is happening at the opposite end of the continental plates that uh, are being pushed into the, uh, the adjacent plates. And so you can see at the end, the outer end, the plates are going into the mantle underneath perhaps the adjacent plates if there are. We'll see some examples of this. And so that's one idea. That's one notion that comes into the catastrophic model. Uh, this is also uh, part of just standard traditional te uh, plate tectonics, except here we're talking about a much faster rate. We're talking about what, what is called in the literature runaway subduction, that this is happening very quickly. Okay. Now we come to this mantle-wide um, flow, and this is a deformation of the Earth's mantle. And this is occurring in response to this uh, subduction. So this material is starting to convect, if you will, and, um, and you see it in this pattern here. And remember that the, uh, the mantle is not, it's uh, malleable. So uh, this is happening in this mantle material, and it's due to subduction and the plates moving apart. Now remember, this is happening very quickly, relatively speaking.
And then, of course, the third and final element that we have in this tectonic model is in the center of the plates. And uh, this is where the plates are moving apart. This is at the other end of the plate, right in the middle. The plates are moving apart and uh, forming what we know today as the ocean basin, at least the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so, so this is important. So in the, in what's happening here is in the middle of the shelf where the um, plates are spreading from, material is being added to the ocean basin through the through the, uh, what we call the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And material at the other end where there is subduction occurring, material is taken out. Okay, So that's important to real remember. In fact, we saw this in one of the earlier sessions when we looked at uh, some, uh, uh, some of these non-radiometric processes, if you remember, uh, how old the Earth is due to certain things. And we found that one of the ideas is uh, one of the examples is material uh, accumulating in the ocean. And one of the uh, ways in which material is taken out of the ocean is through this subduction. Material is added through the uh, riverbeds. So while the tectonic activity is spreading, it's adding material in the center of this great landmass. So what is going on here? I just have an example here. Uh, I don't know if you can see everything, but if you look at those little arrows in this uh, particular slide, it basically gives you the direction in which the continents are moving. So you can see if you look at South America and Africa, South America is moving southwest. Uh, uh, Africa is kind of moving in a rotation way, uh, manner, but it's also moving uh, somewhat to the east as you can see, if you notice the arrows on the right of the continent, so it is kind of in a rotating fashion. You can see Antarctica moving away from Africa toward the south, and North America then you can see moving northwest away from uh, Africa. And so you can see how these arrows indicate the direction that these particular continental plates are moving. Now the thing to remember is that <clears throat> The areas of subduction that we see today, for example, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, this is where the ring of fire uh, exists, right? And these are areas where things are being subducted, plates are being subducted, going under each other and um, causing a lot of friction and creating uh, massive amounts of heat. Unfortunately, you can't see, I guess, uh, the speed at which this is moving. Um, it's moving at uh, several kilometers, uh, so, I'm sorry, several meters uh, per second. And uh, unfortunately, you can't see that on this slide. It's, it's for some reason cut off. But notice the temperature scale here. If you look at the uh, Pacific Rim, you can see where the temperatures are uh, much higher in these areas of subduction, especially in the Pacific Rim, which we still see today. Okay, and you can see some of the... Um, some of these subduction zones in the Caribbean as well, the, the newly formed Caribbean, I might add. So that is the breaking up of Pangaea. When the uh, fountains of the Great Deep broke up, that split the continental shelf, uh, the continental plates, and things began to move apart. Okay. So that is the general model in a very high-level way. And uh, let's take a look then at this continental strata. If this model is correct, if this all happened in this way, let's take a look at what this all means to the geology that you and I are walking on every day. Okay, so here we see um, the geologic column. Now this column that you see on the right, that is, pretend that's the uh, the geologic column of the flood world, the pre-flood world. Before the flood occurred, that's what the column might have looked like. Okay, So day three um, saw, create, saw the creation of the antediluvian column. And there's several things that we've touched on before that we'll reiterate. The entire antediluvian geologic column was formed in less than 24 hours. Okay. So miles and miles of rock layers, sedimentary layers and so on, were all created on day three. 
That was before plant life occurred. So what would you and I expect then if we were antediluvian geologists? We would expect to find absolutely no fossils whatsoever in the geologic column that we're digging in, right? Because life occurred after the column was laid down. Now that's an important thing to remember. Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so no fossilization occurred on day three. Now, um, those layers that we see, we call that Precambrian. Cambrian is the Latin name for life. And uh, so where you find, uh, where you don't find life in the geologic column is called the Precambrian, no life, before life. Okay, so what, what happened here then? <clears throat> the flood came, and as we had mentioned, the ocean basins rose, the flood waters then catastrophically dredged out the then continental mass, redeposited that material as, the, as the, um, the waters moved about, and then there would have been runoff as the ocean basin then slowly sank. Okay. So the flood would have ripped up much of the antediluvian geologic column. The previous column would have been redeposited in the form we see today. So as a result of the flood, the antediluvian column was ripped up, dredged up, and then redeposited in the form that we see today. So there has to be a boundary then that exists between the pre-flood and the flood world or strata. So theoretically what this predicts is that you and I should be able to dig down and come to a point in different areas, and it would be, of course it would vary from location to location, but theoretically you and I should be able to dig down and come to the point where we run into rocks that were created on day three, creation rocks. So we're digging through layers that were laid down by the flood, and then finally we hit these layers that were laid down on creation week. So we might expect to find fossils in the flood layers, but we wouldn't expect to find any fossils in the creation layers. And that is called the pre-flood flood boundary. And of course, it might vary from place to place. And you can kind of see this, um, well, the, 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 you can see this in this little graphic here. Um, the, the very bottom strata layers represent pre-flood layers, layers that were created on day three. And then we have this blue section, which would have been um, uh, laid down by the flood, of course, and um, uh, the flood would have dredged down differently in different locations, so you wouldn't expect a nice, even, horizontal line throughout the geologic column, right? You would expect, you know, softer material would have been able to be dredged further down and so on. And uh, so you would expect this pre-flood flood layer to be different uh, in different areas of the world. But on top of that, then, of course, you see the flood layers that have been laid down. So that's what we're trying to show here in this particular graphic. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here we have um, this idea of sediment transport. When the f um, subduction occurs, you can see the, the layers, um, of the continental shelf, the plates uh, moving toward your left, right? So they're going the... Um, the um, the, uh, the oceanic plate is moving into or underneath the continental plate that is being downwarped by the subduction of, this, of the plate to your right. So what this subduction would do is it would take material out of the ocean basin and bring it underneath these other plates. Okay? At the same time, you would expect that this subduction would cause an upwarp, an upwarp of the... Um, continental edge, if you will, under the, the ocean basin, and that the continental plate might be downwarped as this subduction is pulling the plate down. So you'd expect this massive scraping at this particular uh, location. Okay? So this is a way in which material can, can be taken out of the ocean basins 
and uh, redeposited uh, close or underneath the uh, continental shelf. Okay, so let's take a look then and see what we have. So the flood proper lasted roughly 370 days. Uh, the flood strata were laid down in slightly more than a year. So we're only looking at a year for most of this activity to occur. Okay? So everything was happening very rapidly, very catastrophically. So due to this catastrophic dredging and deposition, uh, this occurred and allowed for this catastrophic plate tectonic action to occur. So, um, so the main focus on catastrophic plate tectonics is this catastrophic dredging and deposition of material uh, afterward. And I, um, I think this is probably the truest statement. Uh, the miracle is, uh, I would argue, that Noah even survived all this activity. When you consider the catastrophic nature of the flood, the waters moving back and forth, uh, the fact that Noah survived is just a remarkable thing, in my view. Uh, you know, you've seen on some of these YouTube videos um, very agitated oceans and waves and things uh, occurring, you know, 30, 60 feet swales. Uh, imagine something on a much larger scale, and yet uh, Noah survived. It's interesting, too, reading some of the pseudepigrapha, some of the uh, commentary about what was going on in the ark. Uh, that um, some of the folks on the ark weren't too happy. They were a little, little concerned that they may not survive. Uh, we're not told that in the biblical record, though. Okay, so what we have here now is, is our own world today, as we see it. Um, we see that uh, in, in between North America, South America, and Africa, Europe, we see this scar but right in between the, the, uh, the continents in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This, of course, is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And this is considered to be uh, the fountains of the Great Deep, that uh, this scar around the entire globe at some 40,000 miles in length, um, <clears throat> uh, you can see Iceland, that it's just a glob in the middle of this, this uh, three-dimensional scar, and uh, it basically wraps around the Earth. The Earth is 25,000 miles in, in circumference, and this particular scar takes off in many, many different directions, and it's roughly 40,000 miles in length. So this is, the, this is the, uh, the fountains of the Great Deep. This is what was breaking up then during the flood. Now, this was not known until roughly, whoops, roughly World War II. Um, this mid-Atlantic ridge was not known. Uh, they were doing underwater surveys uh, as a result of World War II, and they found this to be the case, and they were uh, rather shocked. Uh, this, this actually uh, provided uh, some really interesting discussion in the geologic world just after World War II. So it's from that, we use the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it's from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge then where North Amer the North American plate separated from the African continent and the South American plate um, separated from the African continent as well. And each one of these plates then was moving and still is moving but at a much slower pace. So the point in showing this slide is that this slide is the same slide that any plate tectonic geophysicist would show you as a result of plate tectonic theory. The difference between catastrophic, catastrophic plate tectonics and traditional plate tectonics is essentially speed. Okay, let's take a look at the pluses and minuses of catastrophic plate tectonics. Provides a powerful mechanism for the flood and sedimentation and some post-flood phenomena provides for re rapid continental separation, and it provides for rapid mountain building. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. And, of course, it provides for the required heat for the glacial epoch. One of the things we really aren't mentioning in great detail in this series is the glacial epoch. But if the fountains of the Great Deep are breaking up, uh, this molten material that's coming up is forming steam, massive catastrophic amounts of steam. And this steam is getting into the upper atmosphere and um, this heated water vapor 
getting into the upper atmosphere, convecting and producing biblical proportions of snowfall and creating the glaciers and working their way down from the polar regions down through the, toward the equatorial uh, regions of the earth. So this model provides a nice mechanism for the glacial epoch, that there was only one glacial epoch just after and resulting from the flood. Actually, probably it started during the flood. All right, some of the minuses that need to be worked on. Heat production and dissipation is a significant problem. This was uh, greatly discussed at the last ICC, uh, that the amount of heat is, uh, you know, how do, we get a, how do we get away, how do we get rid of this heat if these, on a continental scale, are dragging on these plates. These plates are dragging in a mantle. Where's that heat being dissipated into? That's an interesting problem. Does subduction actually occur? This is a, um, an issue that Michael Lord has takes issue with. Is there a, a lack of mechanism, as Ord claims, uh, on uh, the tectonic model? And, of course, is the ocean surface consistent with the catastrophic plate model? So these are some of the things that proponents of the, the model have to work out, especially the heat problem. Um, that's going to be a problem for any catastrophic model like this because you're generating so much heat in such a short period of time, you have to get rid of it somehow. And um, so that's a potential problem. Part of the mechanism can be the formation of the glacial epoch because it requires heat to generate snow. And you might think, well, wait a minute, <laughs> it's cold out there today. How can, it, how can you need heat? Well, you need heat to get the water into the upper atmosphere and convect into the polar regions to start raining down snow, if you will. And um, so, so heat is required for the glacial epoch. So let's take a look at some post-flood activities. And we'll see some uh, fun things here, I think. All right, we'd mentioned um, uh, mountain building. This is actually kind of a fun topic because the question is uh, these, these mountains that we see uh, daily in pictures or we walk on, uh, they can be of different types. And if you look at the Him Himalayas, they are a particular type. They're broken. They're, uh, uh, they're not folded rocks, if, if you will, like the... Um, uh, many of the Appalachians. Well, how were the Himalayas formed? They were formed by the Indian plate moving northward into the Asian plate or the Eurasian plate. And so as these plates moved together, the, uh, the land masses were lifted up, broken up, forming the Himalaya mountains. Now these, of course, are some of the highest mountains in the world on the surface. And so this north-south movement, if you will, creates mountain ranges that go east-west. And there we see two examples, the Himalayas moving essentially east-west and uh, the Alps, where the Alps were formed by the, the Italian plate moving into the uh, European plate, forming the Alps. Okay? And um, the other thing that may have helped moving this plate northward is in fact the glacial epoch. Um, one of the things that uh, are an element within a model that uh, David Nelson is proposing is that the glacial epoch occurred very rapidly and that the glaciers moved from the polar regions outward on the surface of the earth toward the equatorial area. Well, as that glacier is moving out in a catastrophic way very rapidly, it is, um, it's changing the angular momentum of the Earth, right? All this material is moving away from the spin axis of the Earth. So in that way, think about a figure skater. When the figure skater keeps their arms in toward their waist, they spin quickly. As their arms go out, they spin more slowly, right? So as this ice mass is coming down away from the spin axis, as it's coming away from it, the Earth is going to want to slow up, okay? But the Earth really doesn't want to slow up. Why? Because it's a great massive object. So what happens? Instead of the Earth slowing up, the plates counteract the, the, uh, the ice coming down and move north to, to uh, conserve angular momentum. So this is a big 
part of his model. So one of the main mechanisms then in the uh, Nelson model, which is not a tectonic model, is that the Indian plate moved north due to the conservation of angular momentum, just like a figure skater. Okay. Now we have mountain ranges that are typically oriented north-south. And of course, there we see the, the uh, Andes Mountains in South America. And uh, this would be due to plates moving east-west, okay, the, the, uh, the, um, the, southern, the southern American plate moving into the, uh, the Pacific plate. <clears throat> and this is creating a mountain range north-south in the Andes and uh, the Appalachians, the Rockies, and so on. All these are mountain ranges that would be arranged or oriented north-south that are caused by east-west motion of the plates. Okay. So, um, so these are some kind of interesting things that are a result of the uh, tectonic model, catastrophic tectonic model, which we uh, affectionately call CPT. And um, so, uh, so this is kind of some fun stuff. Let's take a look at the, uh, the Grand Canyon now. And uh, here we can see some really uh, cool things. Has anybody been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, good. Yeah, the Grand Canyon is uh, an, an amazing place. Uh, you can see the entire, almost the entire Earth history from a geological perspective right there in the Grand Canyon, as we will see. So let's take a look at uh, what uh, is in the Grand Canyon. The North Rim, you can see the Colorado River there in the middle of your page coming down from the north, turning east-west and uh, uh, just continuing off the page. The North Rim of the uh, Colorado River is 8,000 feet high. What's interesting is the Southern Rim is 7,000 feet high. And when you're standing there, you can actually see that difference. So there's 1,000 feet worth of elevation between the North Rim and the South Rim, okay, like this. The other interesting thing is the headwaters of the Colorado River is at 5,000 feet. Do you see a problem here with traditional models? Water doesn't go uphill. <laughs> How did this happen? How was this canyon carved if we're expected to think that the Colorado River over millions of years carved out this remarkable canyon? In fact, the erosion patterns that we see at the Grand Canyon is precisely the type of erosion pattern you'd expect in a catastrophic dredging of something like this, nevertheless. Okay, so we see these differences in elevations. Um, we see the water has to come over a hill to, uh, to get to the Grand Canyon or to carve it out. And so we have some issues here. So how does, um, how does this all happen? Well, um, prior to the flood, I'm sorry, prior to uh, the uh, dredging of the canyon, uh, as a result of the flood, there were many lakes in North America. And um, Edmund Holroyd has done some really remarkable work on identifying ancient lake shores, ancient, ancient uh, inland seashores in the Colorado, Utah area. And what he's identified is a host of lakes, two of which are Canyonlands Lake and Hoppy Lake. And um, <clears throat> so the model suggests that, um, that the Grand Canyon was catastrophically created through the breaching of these two lakes. So uh, what we see then is as a result of, of some catastrophic breach, of these two lakes, the canyon was formed. So about 500 years after the flood, that's roughly the time frame that we're looking at, you can see in the top slide, Hoppy Lake in the, the, uh, the south, canyon, canyon Lands Lake in the north, and the first thing that occurred was due to a weakness in this Kaibab upwarp that you see in the middle, in the, uh, the middle slide there you see the, um, uh, the Hoppy Lake uh, broke through this upwarp and began to carve out the Grand Canyon. Then later, the Canyonlands Lake uh, breached its wall, 
and that continued to carve out the Grand Canyon. And so this kind of erosion pattern that you see at the Grand Canyon, what we see here, is in fact something you would expect to see <clears throat> from a catastrophic kind of dredging. Okay? When you see these sharp edges, uh, that, that's kind of an indication of a catastrophic breach. So let's take a look at the pre-flood flood boundary because this is an, also another fun uh, topic here. And uh, we'll take a look at the Grand Canyon. Uh, if you notice here, this is a, um, a segment of the Grand Canyon and you'll see different layers at different angles and so on. So let's take a look. Uh, what you see in the left, you see that what looks like a batholith, right, at, at uh, the Zoroaster um, granite. So that pink material there is actually granite. It's an igneous rock. Then above that is this green material called the Vishnu schist and the bass shale and so on. So these rocks, if you notice, they are upwarped like this, right? But they're also tilted, if you notice. Okay, so due to uh, continental movement, the the uh, as the continents are moving east west, these guys are being tilted like that. Okay, so they're being like you would if you push the ends uh, to the two ends of a paper together, you get these folds, and that's what's happening here. <clears throat> so the so okay so the the uh, so the way the model works then is the flood came along and catastrophically dredged out much of the antediluvian geologic column, then redeposited it, okay? That's what we see here at what's called the Great Unconformity. Ah, let me get there. Don't want to go there yet. <laughs> so if you notice, the layers on top, starting with the Tapiz sandstone, those layers are relatively horizontal they are laying on top of angled uh, strata, okay? So what the creation model predicts or explains is that the flood occurred, dredged out the material. This upwarping, of course, occurred as well. And the layers that we see on top of these angled layers are the layers that were laid down by the flood, the tapete sandstone, the red wall limestone, and so on. All these layers, then, are flood deposits. Okay, The layers below them are the rocks that were created on day three. Okay, And this kind of situation where you have um, this interruption in the stratigraphic record is called an unconformity. This happens to be called an angled unconformity. There's essentially four types of unconformities. This is an angled unconformity. And here you can actually see it in a real life. If you notice at the bottom of the uh, slides, you can see the angled layers, and then on top of that, you can see the tapete sandstone and all the other remaining layers on top. So you have at the bottom then, you've got rocks that were created and laid down on day three during creation week, and then on top of that, you see flood rocks, and right smack dab where they meet is called the Great Unconformity. So that is when the flood during the, or through the flood, began to lay down this material during the flood. Okay, So when you look at the Grand Canyon, you can actually see the entire creation model there. And it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. So let's take a, a quick summary here. Uh, tectonic action formed the mechanism for continental motion and catastrophic upheaval of continental creation rocks. Uh, material was redeposited through massive water action over the continental crust. So as we had mentioned, due to the ocean basins rising, the water dredged out the, the, uh, the um, pre-flood continent. And then as the oceans laid down, the water uh, came you know, back off the, the continents and um, back into the ocean basins. So the uh, continents were dredged up and then redeposited in today's form. We see post-flood activities modified flood deposits, such as the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon, the formation of the Grand Canyon is a post-flood event. 
uh, according to the creation model, happened roughly 500 years after the flood, roughly the time of um, Abraham or somewhere in that time frame. So where do we go from here? Well, we need to continue modeling and simulating this. We need to look at the heat problem. We need to look at some of the criticisms that have been offered by other creation friends where they're using their own models. Uh, we need to look at their models. Maybe there might be uh, uh, elements of their model that we can use, such as the Nelson model. Uh, we can take uh, and apply this model to various geologic features and see how it can explain some of these uh, things and, of course, correlate this model with other sciences such as biology. How does this impact the fossil record? Does catastrophic plate tectonics, the nature of CPT, does it impact uh, how we see the fossil record at all? This might be a worthy topic to look into. And, of course, we need to uh, look at other flood models as well and introduce them to the um, uh, peer-reviewed literature. So people who are doing research in some of these other areas, the International Conferences on Creationism highly encourage them to submit their models to peer review. And uh, that's really the, the best way to get things into the, uh, into, um, the accepted creation model. You know, a lot of people are publishing books out there and going kind of a, a you know, circumventing peer review. But uh, start publishing in these journals. Uh, in the ICC proceedings and so on. And that's where these, these uh, folks need to be publishing. So these are some of the references that, um, that I would highly recommend reading, especially the uh, 1986 and the 1994 uh, ICC papers written by Baumgartner. Uh, these are well worth the time. And so I'd like to uh, certainly acknowledge some of the folks that have uh, provided information on this particular topic, and I think that... Uh, the, the beauty about catastrophic plate tectonics, despite the fact we have a long way to go, it does explain an awful lot of what we see in the geologic column. It's not without problems, of course, but it is certainly a model that can be used to explain an awful lot of uh, information that we see, data that we know from the field, and uh, so it's a model that I think that's worthy to pursue. So having said that, let's, uh, let's open up uh, for some questions.